we'll, we'll try to keep this interesting since I know we're the only thing between you and, and Mixer. So. Oh, yeah. We have to be more interesting than wine. Can we do it? I think. We'll okay, try. we can do it. Yeah. So you've been in kind of the pretty unique position of having worked in startups, in finance, in venture capital. And as we know, and we're kind of reminded by recent events in the news, there's not a whole lot of women who work in venture capital. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's like and how it's kind of different than the other industries that you've worked in? Uh, so I consider myself very lucky in terms of my experiences because when you say startups, finance, venture capital, these are not generally um, you know, groups or industries that are very good at diversity and having supportive cultures. But then if I tell you about my actual experiences, I've had uh, you know, very special experiences or been part of very supportive organizations and I think choosing who you um, are going to work with is just a really important decision that colors your experiences. So. Um, my first job was working for my family's company. Uh, my parents run a technology startup. It's uh, over a decade old now, so I, I don't know if you still count it as a startup, but it's a large technology company. Um, and my parents are both engineers. And I think that just really had a lasting impact on me, seeing you know, my mother obviously became a mother at some point, and a working mom, uh, and a, a culture where uh, being the boss's daughter, I probably had a, a few sort of special advantages, I'm sure. Um, but, but even just seeing uh, from the very beginning that leadership comes in many different forms was really important to me. And everybody knows that, you know, my mom runs that company. Um, uh, and, and, and then um, if I think about my experience in finance, uh, uh, after business school, I worked at Goldman Sachs in the Bay Area, and I did... Um, technology investing for them out of something called the Internet Opportunities Fund. Uh, and, you know, it's a largely male-dominated group, but uh, there were actually really good diversity programs for us at Goldman in that office in particular. And I think it's um, just reflecting on the last conversation, it's really important to see how people model behavior um, that you think you're going to have to copy in the future, right? So I would see my partners or female MDs disappear because they had to go to a soccer game or because they needed to deal with some important family obligation and we didn't really have a FaceTime culture and I think that was um, abnormal for a lot of finance jobs as well. And then I've been at Greylock for the past four years um, and I've had the privilege of working with women partners, which I think, as pointed out, is, is also always a special experience. Um, but, but I also think it's, it's unfair to um, expect women to take the entire burden of diversity on ourselves, right? Uh, and so I'm really privileged that uh, Greylock has about 10 investing partners, and I think the people I work with, like James on the, on the Redfin board and my other partners, they're highly evolved people, right? They like want to do right by the startup community and uh, have been very supportive of me and my career. I've actually had mostly male champions, mostly because I, I think interact with men in Silicon Valley. Um, but but I, I just feel very lucky to have chosen a series of, com I didn't choose the first company that kind of grew up with that, but, but having chosen and been part of experiences even within these, you know, not so diverse communities that have worked for me. And I, I would encourage people to go look for those, um, look for those communities and a lot of our companies are hiring too. So one of these like really highly evolved men is Reed Hoffman, right? Who is somebody that you work very closely with. And so you kind of had this cool front row seat to the development of his decency pledge. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm curious to know like kind of where that came from and how you see it and what do you think it's, what impact do you think it's going to have? So it's really disappointing that it's necessary, right? Uh, I mean, I'm, I, in, in case people don't know what Rebecca's referring to, um, over the last few weeks and months in, in Silicon Valley and in the tech world in general, um, we've seen... Uh, a bunch of large technology companies expose um, abusive cultures and cultures that aren't working and aren't supportive of, of different types of people. Um, and then we've seen VCs abuse their position, which is an, a position of power, right? It, people need capital to, um, 
to start companies and to scale companies. And then as they, as they grow, your relationship as an entrepreneur with your board members or your investors, it's not one of management, but it's certainly one of um, unbalanced power because in the end, the board can fire the CEO, for example, um, and they can choose to give you capital or not. Um, and so Reed's decency pledge was a reaction to um, some of what has happened with, with binary capital and with other um, situations where women have been, um, I don't know what the right term is, but, but put under um, really inappropriate pressure by male VCs. Uh, and, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm ever going to be in this situation being a female VC, so come talk to me. But, um, but Reed's decency pledge was, uh, it was a couple things. It was suggesting that um, this, it, it was saying clearly this kind of behavior is totally unacceptable. Um, and uh, we need to call it out when we see it. We need to commit to understanding this relationship between VCs and entrepreneurs as one of um, power that we need to treat like a, you know, a sensitive relationship, like you might treat a manager relationship. Um, and, and we also can't tolerate it as a community, right? So we just talked about how technology and venture and boards are all really network driven. Um, it, all of the Valley is very reputation driven. And I think one of the things that's happened is when people hear rumors or when people see inappropriate behavior, um, uh, and, and this isn't just diversity, like harassment is a totally different level of, of problem, right? But um, Silicon Valley has been quite tolerant. And I think the point is like we can't be tolerant, even if it's uh, awkward or even if it's difficult, even if those people have been important for us to work with. Um, it, like, the decency pledge is saying like I'm going to choose not to work with people who act like that. So I, I think me and the Greylock team are, are very proud of Reed for using his platform um, and his voice to, to speak up about the issue. And it seems like a lot of people have signed up already. Like, it's kind of snowballing. Yeah, yeah. The good thing is I, I think the, the vast majority of people in Silicon Valley want to be decent people and, and sort of agree that these are, these are um, principles we should abide by. So we're excited about the support so far. So I want to talk about Let's say you're an entrepreneur, you're just starting out, and I think we've heard a couple times today, there's so much money floating around, you can always find money. How do you even meet these people with all of this money to give away to your cool starting out business? Like, what's some of your advice to some people that are, that are starting? Like, where do they go? Who do you talk to? Um, so, uh, your job as a venture capitalist is to make yourself available to entrepreneurs who want to start companies and are looking for capital and support and then to help them build companies. So, so the first thing I would say is be unafraid to reach out. Um, and and uh, I, I mean, I have a bunch of specific advice about how to get through to VCs, uh, but I will say that like some of the traditional advice has been like never cold call a VC. I'd say that's probably not the best way, but we've made investments in pitches that have come in totally cold. Uh, and another thing is, you know, if I look at my inbox every week, 99% of the cold pitches I receive are from men. So, so first is like absolutely reach out. Um, Second is uh, people, you're, you're, because there are a lot of people with ideas and ambition, you're doing a certain degree of filtering um, to sort of figure out where are the first meetings I want to take. And one of the most important things to filter on is sort of um, the credibility of referrals, right? So if Glenn at Redfin sends me um, an email that says, I met this really awesome female entrepreneur in Seattle, you should meet her, I'm gonna take that meeting all day. Um, and, and, and so I would say um, it's, I, I think the best way to get to a VC is to network through through an entrepreneur that you respect or that you think the VC respects or another technology executive, right? Like um, on, any, on any board, you spend a lot of time with um, the head of engineering and product and marketing and all of those people are really valuable referral sources um, as well as angel investors. And so I would say, well, while networking with women is great because I think they're like actually really interested and willing to help you, um, networking with the people that are in VCs networks is, is the way to focus your efforts. 
And so let's say that I networked through and Glenn probably referred me to you to get a meeting. What should I do to prepare for that first meeting? What is something, what do you expect when you're meeting with an entrepreneur? What do you like to see? What do you hope that they bring? Um, so this won't be a Greylock commercial, but I'll tell you enough about us so you know <laughs> where we sort of invest. Um, so uh, we're a billion dollar fund, but we invest in largely early stage companies. And, and to us, that means uh, series A and Series B investing. So I'm involved with um, five companies that we got involved with at the Series A and one that was sort of an early B, just to give you a sense. And, and we do later stage investing as well. Um, but uh, the reason I mentioned stage is what is expected of an entrepreneur at different stages is very different. So um, a, a very simple framework is that um, at the seed level, you really just need to have some idea and the beginnings of execution just to show people that you can get momentum around hiring, around making progress, around implementation, um, having you know, in your tiny team of one or two or three a culture of building already. Um, at, the, at the Series A level, this isn't always true, but having like some version, even one you're really embarrassed uh, uh, about um, showing people, some version of a product. Um, at the Series B, uh, we tend to expect a little bit more something that looks like product market fit, so people actually want what you have built. Um, and then beyond that, it, it's more about uh, sort of we really obsess about distribution at Greylock. So let's say you've built um, the best real estate brokerage product in the world. Like you still have to get it in front of consumers or get it in front of brokers or hire them and, and figuring out how you um, grow your sales and marketing or how you grow organically uh, is sort of the next step and, 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 and so on from there. But I'll focus at the beginning because mostly people sort of learn more and more about how to interact with investors as they progress. Um, at the, at the seed level, we say idea, just to say you don't have to show that much progress yet, but we're, um, at that level, most of our seed investments are investments in a founder um, or a founding team. We're saying we want to work with this person, and we think the basic area that they're working in is um, interesting and worthwhile working on and commercially fertile. Uh, and, and so, um, and, and that they've got some unique insight about it, right? If, if there's some, if, if there are a hundred different people who could go execute on your idea and there's no reason you should win in that game, then that's not a very interesting investment to us. But if you could just answer those couple questions um, at the seed level, that is a, is a great place to start. Uh, I would suggest for that first meeting that you do prepare. Uh, it's not a job interview, but I am surprised that people, I think there's, there's a little bit of a, a cultural meme like pitching is uncool and being prepared to pitch or creating a slide deck is uncool. Um, I don't love creating slide decks either. I think like, uh, or, or presenting in general, creating uh, concise language to communicate to people or visuals you know, some idea in a, in a short amount of time, it's hard. Um, but I, I think structuring your thoughts ahead of time and trying to plan for the kinds of questions you think investors will ask is important. And I think, uh, you know, people who do that preparation are more likely to be successful than otherwise. So in this case, it's probably not a good power move to walk in just with your phone. I think if you're Mark Zuckerberg and you want to start another company, you can go ahead and do that. But the rest of us should sort of like, you know, try to increase our chance of success. And you and I were talking about this a little bit, and I'm curious to kind of hear more about this. You shouldn't just take money from anyone that offers it to you, right? How do you kind of suss out, this is like somebody that you're going to be working with every single day, probably for hopefully a long time. And so how do you find out like, is this person even a good fit for me? Like what are some of the things that you look for there? Um, yeah, I do think personal chemistry is really important in terms of choosing your investor. And obviously uh, there are some of our entrepreneurs that I talk to daily. Uh, you know, one of, our, one of our founders came to my wedding, for example, like that is a very close friend um, and, and business partner. But, um, but you don't talk to all of your investors every day. That actually sounds quite scary. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think the first filter for us is integrity. And I don't know how you really define that, except it's 
um, you know, you're looking for people who have shared values, and here's, I think, where diversity does play a role. If you can tell at the very beginning that, um, that you're gonna have problems around that, like maybe that's a bad sign, right? Um, other than that, I think, um, like, I can only speak from one side of the equation. I mean, I guess I've raised money before, but you know, the company didn't get very far. So I'll, I'll talk about it from um, the experience of being an investor at Greylock. Um, I look for people who I think uh, really have a point of view, but then are open-minded, right? Because uh, as, as a company grows, the entrepreneur or, and their team and the investor, they're never gonna know everything and they're gonna run into a million situations and surprises that are both good and bad and um, I think companies that are successful, they're the ones who can learn in an accelerated way together productively. Uh, and, and so uh, those are the best relationships that I have where I feel like we can learn together and we, we figure out how to communicate well pretty quickly. Um, and, and so I'd say like, it's very hard to test for that at the beginning. Um, and so sometimes people will be like, well, why does this investor want to meet me like three times or four times or something? It's because if they're taking a board seat, like that could be a five or 10 year commitment um, if you're lucky and the company is working, right? So you should also want to meet that person a couple times. Um, it's easier to get rid of a spouse than a board member. Uh, and, and so uh, not that, not that we're all trying to get rid of these things or anything, but, um, but, but I, I do think that you know, there's, there's no substitute for spending time with the person on the other side of the table. And then I think there are some warning signs as well as some signals of like, oh, we have really high bandwidth communication, or this person makes me think about the problem in different and useful ways that are, that are good signals for the future. What are some of those warning signs? Like, what are things you don't really like to see? Um, I think at Greylock we have a, a culture of everybody having been in a, you know, a technology company of some kind at some point, um, there's a great deal of respect and empathy for the entrepreneur. So we're, we're certainly not going into our companies thinking like, this is the right way to do things and like, here's how you should run your company. Um, but we're also there with a point of view. And, and I think one of, the, one of the signals that I think is quite dangerous when I meet with an entrepreneur for the first time is, um, you know, if I come in with humility and asking questions about how their market works or why they decided to build the product this way, uh, and um, there's a lot of resistance to answering that question or following a certain train of thought or explaining something, like that's a bad signal to me because you should want me to understand like uh, your point of view and then we should talk about whether or not like that's the right point of view because my, m I mean startups they operate in like really low information environments. We don't know. We don't know what the consumer wants. We don't know what the employees want. Um, we don't know what the market is gonna bring. We don't know what Amazon is gonna do, right? Like all of these things change all the time. And, and so um, being, being like extremely stubborn is really important as an entrepreneur sometimes, but, uh, but if, you, if you're not even willing to sort of think about the question, like that's something that I think is a really bad signal. And then we talked about another one, which is like, um, if, you, if you can, this happens rarely actually, but um, it, it has happened to me before where your biases about gender or experience or ethnicity are apparent at the beginning. That's like a pretty bad sign too. What does that kind of look like? Like how do you even see that appear? Um, well, uh, I, I, I'd say like I, I work in a very privileged job and I'm super grateful about that. But uh, in the end, like I don't look like everyone's sort of prototypical mental image of a technical person, especially not one that invests in some of the stuff that I invest in, like machine learning enabled applications or security or infrastructure, right? But like, I love that stuff. That's what I mostly invest in at Greylock. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I talked to a whole span of entrepreneurs and some of them, I don't know, through their life experiences have worked with mostly technical folk or technology and product and marketing executives um, that don't look like me. And, and so they, you know, if they don't believe that I understand their product or market or, um, or are surprised that like, you know, I can take a board or write a check for Greylock, then uh, I think 
my, my general attitude has been to give some people, you know, the limited benefit of the doubt to get past that surprise. But if you can't, I think that's your problem and not mine. Absolutely. Yep. That totally makes sense. So tell me about that technology. Like what kind of tech trends are you interested in right now? What's kind of exciting to you? What do you like to focus on? Yeah, um, I, I do think that uh, venture, um, sometimes you develop like really strong theses or you're looking for a product that you feel like is missing. And so um, occasionally we incubate companies at Greylock. Um, I've been involved in several of these. Uh, one of these companies is a security company that's going to uh, launch um, very, very soon. Um, uh, but most of the time, uh, like, the ideas don't come from us. They come from the entrepreneur. And so uh, it's, it's fun for me because I get to look at a very macro level. And if I think about, like, very macro level trends, um, consumers are expecting better and better digitally enabled experiences. Um, that could be in their financial products, in the way they buy homes, in the way they buy anything, in the way they consume media. And so we're always looking for sort of those new digital experiences just at the really broad level. Um, then from a, like a sort of core technology perspective, for quite a while, a lot of my really smart friends that are still in like actual implementation of engineering um, are, um, are really excited about the possibilities of machine learning in different applications. Um, and so some of the ways that this is manifesting now are in like the new interfaces for applications. So you'll see chat show up in a lot of applications and sometimes the back end to that chat, your experience might feel like natural language, but it might be somewhat automated on the back end. Um, or you'll see you know, new devices in the home that rely on voice. I think that's really interesting. You see media consumption changing in different ways. So um, you know, podcasting is up and to the right, for example. Um, and uh, you see the emergence of sort of other, you know, some other examples of how machine learning is manifesting is uh, it drives um, computer vision powered applications. So um, I don't know if you guys have experienced a lot of augmented reality applications, but we're seeing some of those capabilities show up on mobile devices today. And the, the technology behind that is being able to understand from photos the structure of your environment. And I think that's amazing. I think we're going to see a lot of really cool applications come out of that, especially when that technology is baked into the phones that we all carry 24 hours a day already. Wait, what does that mean? Photos that show the structure of your environment? Um, so uh, you, you can go Google AR kit and see some video demos. I feel like that's the, uh, you know, that's my most recent um, sort of fangirling, uh, but, um, but uh, just to sort of give you guys a, a visual mental picture, um, you might take your phone and you're used to, you know, using the camera to scan around, but now you could measure your house, you could picture what a new piece of furniture looks like in it, um, you could play games that include like, you know, some portion of your real environment and, and also things that aren't actually there, but look like they're there. So I think there's a, there's a, we're just scratching the surface of the kinds of applications people are going to build with that. See, this is why my phone is my best friend. I just can't get rid of it because it does all these really cool things for me. Yeah, I think sometimes you hear VCs in the Valley talk about or blog about or tweet about how like mobile is over. Um, I am only more and more attached to my phone, probably in an unhealthy way, so I totally yeah, agree with that. Too. <laughs> yeah. So do you have some advice for female entrepreneurs who are maybe thinking about starting a company and just are maybe a little bit intimidated by the process and not really sure where to start? What should they be thinking about? Um, so I will forget what Wise Soul told me this in my first year in venture, but um, they, they said to me, there are two reasons that are sort of the vast majority of reasons companies fail. The first is that they don't get started um, because people, because it's really hard. And I think like this is one of the reasons we have such respect for entrepreneurs at Greylock, that the amount of inertia you have to get over to you know, leave your job, try to recruit people, begin to build something, show people that thing, um, and, and iterate. That's just, it's the hardest thing in the world that I can think of. Um, I mean, not a mother yet, so maybe that's harder. I don't know. <laughs> Sounds pretty hard. Um, uh, but but I, I think, you know, that's reason number one. And then reason number two is you build something that people don't want, right? You can talk about all of the other reasons that companies fail, but there's actually... Um, I think it was Crunchbase or someone did like 
a survey of entrepreneurs where their companies had collapsed at some point um, and asked them in a whole bunch of different ways, like, why, why didn't it work? Uh, and um, if, you, if you summarize it, it was basically that uh, they built something and people didn't want it or they couldn't distribute it, which I think is actually pretty much the same as people didn't want it. Um, uh, and and it's, it's interesting because that's sort of a problem you can solve at the very beginning, right? Like you can go and get a lot of information about um, what the consumer wants and do research if you're a B2B company about like how the organization would consume a software like or, or a product like the one you're trying to build. And so one thing that we really look for that would be you know useful advice for entrepreneurs is um, get as much data and feedback about how your product would be received um, as you can and, and try to do it in ways you don't you don't have to build the entire thing and then find out if it's going to work, right? You can, um, you know, the more realistic um, the product experience is, the better, but user surveys and mocks and sitting with users and, and uh, trying all of these things at the, at the very beginning can sort of set you on the right path. So I just have one more question that I promise I'll stop talking. You guys can ask questions, but I, I'm wondering, you mentioned your mom earlier, and it sounds like you've had a couple other really great mentors. Are there a few people that have been really influential in your career, and how did they help you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I think my, my mother is probably first, um, but, uh, and you know, my dad's an engineer, CEO, founder, all of that's great. Um, but. Uh, over the last few years, my, my first year at Greylock, uh, I, I spent a lot of time with my partner, Ashim Channa. Um, Ashim's been at Greylock for something like 15 years. He was a technology executive before that. Um, and uh, I really owe a lot of my sort of early success at Greylock to working with him. Um, because I do think venture, in, to some degree, is an apprenticeship job. And like many other jobs, um, perhaps like Bridget with Jen or with, with many of you, um, having a senior person invest in your success makes all the difference in the world. Um, and, and so I'd say like, this is why I consider myself very lucky to be at Greylock because at the beginning working with and absorbing my partner's networks um, so, you know, Reed's network or Ashim's network, uh, working with our portfolio companies. These companies are full of really talented people, and so uh, spending time with them means they probably also know really talented people, and they'll refer entrepreneurs to me, if they like me. Um, uh, and, and just understanding sort of what they were looking for in founders and then how they helped those companies succeed. Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, you have to look for certain traits in a mentor. I was sort of lucky to, to fall into working with a bunch of people that were like this, but people who you know, are secure, who um, in, in their own jobs, who value um, the different life experiences you've had and your judgment, um, and then are actually willing to champion for you. Um, and I think that's been really great within Greylock. I also think it's um, important to go find mentors outside of your organization. Um, there aren't that many you know, senior female investors out there. So I do remember a conversation I had like a year or two ago with, uh, with Anne Mira Co. She's an investor at Floodgate. She's an awesome woman, a seed investor. Um, but I actually went to talk to her because I was just freaking out. I was like, I have never met a woman who was pregnant and had kids as a venture capitalist. And I'll explain like why I was so insecure about this. Um, the first thing you must do to be successful as an investor is like get flow. Like entrepreneurs need to like you or at least know about you and email or call you or let you know when they're raising money. Um, and you know, I, I feel like I, I have great relationships with a lot of entrepreneurs, but I was worried that if I disappeared off the face of the earth to mother a human for a little bit of time, um, which I assumed would be pretty hard, that you know, the, the world would collapse around me and that I'd be a terrible investor forever. Uh, and I talked to Anne about it because she, um, she is an investor who's been quite successful and also has kids that seem great. And, she, uh, and, and so to some degree, uh, it is really nice to hear from people who have walked the exact same steps say, like, it's totally okay. Um, you're going to be fine, and it won't be the end of the world. And here are some, here are some tips about getting through it. And 
Um, I'm not a parent yet, but I plan to be. Uh, and, and I think having both um, uh, role models for that inside and outside of the organization, seeing, seeing my partners uh, very solidly say, like, I have to be online, I'm at the soccer game, I'm with my kid, um, is actually really important for me because it makes me feel like I'm going to be able to do that. That's awesome. Uh, let's do Q&A. Does anybody want to ask a question? Thank you for being here today. My question is, for women who are pitching, do you have some suggestions for building confidence for this process? Uh, so I will say um, it's, it's totally personality dependent and like personal experience dependent, but I'll share one experience with you that um, is one of my own. Uh, so when I was coming out of business school, um, I worked for Goldman for a year, mostly on recommendation of my parents and, and getting out of debt <laughs> to, to uh, you know, go get a real job at like a high quality organization and learn about business. And I, do, I did all of those things. I, I um, have a ton of respect for the people at Goldman. Um, but uh, I knew I wanted to, to work there and I also didn't feel qualified for the interview. Um, and so uh, just in my personality, it makes me feel more comfortable to do a lot of practice. So like I ended up doing like 14 interviews that were relevant to my interview at Goldman and like pushing that date to the last possible date. So when I got in, like nothing was a surprise to me, right? Um, and I think the relevant thing for um, women who are going to be pitching investors for their first time is um, it's, a, it's sort of a common technique to uh, call investors who may not be a good fit for you or who may be friends of yours or who may actually be a good fit and just say, um, I'm going to start a fundraising process. It's my first time doing this or I'd like some help with it. Um, can I get some feedback? Can I pitch you? And uh, I, I think like that should both give you some idea of what you're going to be facing and get you more comfortable with the process. Um, and I do think it like having having a sense of like why do we look for confidence in the entrepreneurs we are meeting with? Um, to, to some degree, a, a company is a story told again and again and again to founders, to um, to like. Uh, investors and recruits and the media and customers until everybody believes it, right? Um, and so practicing that story is really is really important and it's like getting people to believe it requires you to uh, express a lot of confidence in believing it. So it's just sort of a good proxy for the future. Other questions? Okay, we got it. some over here. Just go, okay. Hi. Uh, my name's Becky. I work for um, another Silicon Valley venture capital firm, and I'm just interested as a VC and as a female VC, how you approach building your brand, because I think building your brand can be very important as far as, you know, connecting with entrepreneurs. Is it something you do consciously? And if so, what do you do? Or do you kind of prefer to let your deals speak for themselves? Um, I, I, I do think that Different venture firms have a different cultural attitude toward brand building. Uh, we're pretty new to it uh, in a conscious way. So um, we hired my partner, uh, Lisa Schreiber, who's awesome. She's lead marketing at Hulu a few years ago. And, uh, and you know, the, the, there's a phrase, the world is going inbound, right? People buy a lot more by doing research um, before they talk to a salesperson, like a, a VC, a, a real human. Um, and so it's important to have information uh, uh, out there reputationally about you and on the web, about what you're interested in, about why you're a good board member, et cetera. Um, and, and so I'd say I've just begun to invest in doing this, um, but uh, at the encouragement of my partnership. And I do think that um, in my own personal experiences, women are uh, sort of less inclined to do this naturally or culturally. Maybe we've been taught to, I don't know, um, to, than, than men have because I feel like when I'm going to write a blog post or go give a talk, like I need to have something that's like brilliant and new and like really well thought out to share. Um, but um, I actually have a friend who's the editor of a, like a, 
largely read San Francisco publication who says to me, you will not believe the difference between uh, you know, what I get from male VCs uh, who are asking me to publish something and female VCs. First of all, like 99% of what I get is from men who are like, very convinced that they should go build their brand. Uh, and then like, not all of it is all that good. Right? Um, and so to, to me, I, I always try to um, remind myself, yeah, I think it's an important part of the job now. I think it's actually an important part of the job for companies and for entrepreneurs because um, you have so many external relationships, right? Your partners and your customers expect you and your, your future recruits expect you to market. Uh, and, and so I'd encourage people to do more of it and also to accept some imperfection. Like one of the reasons I'm here today is because I feel like it's important for people to see that there are like female VCs out there. Um, and it's actually because of an experience I had with a, a female entrepreneur I met a few years back who's now a close friend who said to me, in this investing process, uh, I've met with 14 VCs and you're the first woman and I can't tell you how important it is, like what a relief it is just to meet you. Um, and I, I thought, yeah, I can, I can relate to that. Like I you know, probably met with 20 entrepreneurs this week and you're the first female entrepreneur I've met, so I'm really excited about that too. Um, and, and so I think like if you are further along in your career, um, uh, then like being a visible role model is something useful you can do. So you mentioned that you said something about machine learning enablement applications, and you talked about your friends in, that are still actively working in engineering. Before you make an investment, of course, you're doing a ton of research and data gathering. What are some of the other resources that you use for a new industry or a new idea or, or you know, tell me more about this entrepreneur where are you gathering some of that information? Um, yeah, I, I'd say if, if I think about myself and my partners at Greylock, um, people tend to have some narrow domain that they actually understand pretty well, right? Um, so, you know, for me that might be like networking and infrastructure. For one of my partners, it might be marketplaces. So you begin with, um, sometimes you begin with like a, a core of knowledge, but more often we're investing in things that like I can't possibly implement myself, right? Or things where I don't understand the industry dynamic that deeply. Um, and there, um, this is one of the reasons I think like being part of a larger um, platform like Greylock is really nice because our network reaches pretty wide. And the first thing that we do is leverage um, smart people in our network, right? And so if I'm looking at something in um, e-commerce, maybe I'll call Julie, or maybe I will um, talk to the executives at one of our e-commerce companies. So we, we uh, lean on the portfolio, we lean on friends in industry, we lean on smart technical people we know that we don't have any formal relationship with. And so there's, there's a personal um, relationship level to it. And I think that's actually the most valuable thing because you can ask like very specific questions about how something works. Um, then I think like there's, uh, there's a lot of content out there now, right? Um, even for anybody interested in starting a company, there's like a lot of content about how to start a company and how to raise money and different industries and network effects and such things. And so I, I think we, um, at least I read broadly um, uh, and uh, especially like one of the things I will do is when I'm talking to people who work in the industry, I ask them what they read to understand what's going on, right? Um, and uh, and I, I do think that the one of the most important things that we do when we're diligencing a startup, um, if they're if they're far enough uh, along that this is possible, is talk to their partners and their customers and understand like their motivations for working with this company um, and how they think it fits into the overall landscape and sort of like their other challenges and priorities. Um, and just try to do the research from the point of view of um, the company building the product as well. I think it's really different for different industries. I don't, like, if you, if you just want to, like, generally read about technology, like, I read the information a lot. I read the 
Washington Post and the New York Times. Um, but if, for example, like we're invested in um, a, a Seattle startup called Convoy, um, and they're a uh, like a trucking marketplace company, um, I will not say that like before we invest in this company, I spent a lot of time in like trucking trade publications. And, and so um, I think especially as you see software invade lots of different uh, industry domains. Um, I don't know that like my partner James like deeply understood the real estate industry before, but I think he tried rapidly to learn about it before making the investment um, in, in Glenn and the team uh, and knows a lot more about it now. When you're, uh, when people come and meet you, I know you can't say this out loud, but uh, does the age of a, an entrepreneur matter because you only have so much you know time left on this planet so everything you know everything I read and see is all uh, you know people significantly younger starting things off uh, so I wonder do you get people I like to say of a certain age um, looking for funding for a startup yeah, so I would say I am younger than 100% of the founders that I work with personally. Actually, I guess there's one board where I'm not the board member, but uh, I'm involved with the company. Um, so, you know, call it six of seven, right? Um, and I'm older than I look, but still. Um, uh, I, I do think that's sort of a, a cultural problem in Silicon Valley. It's a different kind of bias. Um, but... If I, if, I, if I look at our portfolio, like your life experiences, uh, they, they determine what kind of products and ideas you have, right? So especially for some things, um, or I guess, it, it, I, I spend more time on the B2B side than on the direct to consumer side, but um, like you're never going to build, you're, you're unlikely to build things that work for um, people in their work lives until you've worked. Right? Like you, you sort of need to have that experience to, to understand what's happening in those organizations and in those different roles. Um, and similarly, like I'd, just, um, I'd be more willing to bet if you're going to um, build a company that sells financial products, you've probably used financial products before, like, uh, or, or something that is addressing um, parenthood, like you've probably gone through that experience before. And so um, I think when we, I think it's, it's a bias that we should all keep in mind. Um, but when we are evaluating entrepreneurs, often we're thinking about how the experiences they've had relate to the products they build, right? Um, and, and so uh, we have some very young entrepreneurs, but they kind of span, span a wide gamut, actually. And they're certainly not all 17. I mean, like we were... We were lucky to be um, investors in, in Facebook and Mark, but like our, our, our uh, I don't know, spectrum of entrepreneurs is, is quite broader than that. Okay, we're gonna take one more question and then we're going to wrap up. Hi, Sarah, thanks for sharing your insight today. I'm curious if you could maybe share a little uh, information with those of us who are just looking to build our ground level knowledge on how VC funding works in general because as you've been talking I realize that there's giant holes in my knowledge and, and a lot of things that I've misunderstood about the way it works and if you have any you know specific places that you recommend I take a look I'd be welcome to hear them because I'm looking at joining a startup and I feel that this is extremely germane to what is happening in my life right now thank you yeah, I don't know if there's one um, like well-consolidated resource about how the process works, and this is maybe why people and like continue to encourage VCs to be more transparent and put, put more content out there. Um, but uh, let's see what I would say is like the very baseline. So maybe I'll tell you like how VCs get involved with companies and then how they make money really quickly, just because I, I feel like that's useful background. Um, so at Greylock, um, I think most people are involved with somewhere between five and ten companies. So it's actually quite a small number of companies. Um, we take boards with those companies. Um, you know, we make a small number of, of passive investments, but it's not our core model. Um, and then we take a significant amount of ownership. And, and I said we, we're mostly investing in Series A and Series B. So you can think of that as, you know, five to... 
$25 million checks in general. We've written some checks significantly larger than that um, when we first get involved with the company. Um, then, you know, in those situations, we have a minority of ownership. Um, and we're with the company, if we're lucky, for five or 10 years. Um, and and the, the trade with a VC is that uh, they put that amount of money into your company, um, then they sit on the board, um, and the board, which is usually investors, some, maybe some independent board members who can be helpful to the company, and then the CEO and perhaps some other executives, um, they make sort of strategic decisions about the company, especially around, um, and often especially around hiring. Um, and, uh, and, and sort of that's sort of the, 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 the basis of the relationship. Um, but I'd say like the, the involvement of VCs in startups varies dramatically, right? So uh, if I think about one of my companies, um, the founder started as one person in our offices and then we and some of our, one of my recruiting partners and part of his team helped him find his three co-founders because he wanted to work in a new domain. Um, so we helped him with a bunch of the recruiting. Then uh, we have a customer program and so uh, he talked to probably 50 customers his first year through our relationships trying to define the product. Um, and you know, eventually they, they hired people and got too big to live in our offices, but that was sort of their, their um, first year experience. Um, and you know, we're still super like, involved in, for example, the positioning of that company as it goes to market. So I think there's a, there's a real range of involvement. Um, I think what is, um, what I would think of as important from the perspective of uh, a, an employee joining a startup for the first time is sort of um, what, you know, does that, it, it's really hard to sort of picture the, um, the potential future of a startup, right? Like what the economic outcome is going to be, um, but I, I think uh, a, a soft proxy for that is the, the quality of their investors um, because the investors can help support the company to push them to be ambitious for the really big outcomes, but also um, they can improve the set of outcomes when things don't go as well, right? And so, you know, we help sell a number of companies in, in every fund. Um, and, and so I think there's some level of safety in working for companies that are backed by a really high quality investor. Um, an investor with a good reputation. Um, and then I would look for companies where like, you believe in the mission and you feel like are a resource for that mission. And I think that's something you can ask management, right? Like sort of how do you, how do you see this company growing in the next five years? Like what's your vision for that? Like do we have enough capital to do that? Or like how do you think we're gonna make progress to get the capital to go do that? Those are some of the initial questions I would ask. And those are some of the questions I answer for like our early, our early potential hires when they call me.